So as we've just seen with Sandra's talk, uh, coordinated cancer care remains a key challenge for us across New South Wales. Our next speaker is Professor Tim Shaw from the Sydney Medical School at the University of Sydney. He'll be presenting on prioritising and defining success factors for coordinated cancer care. Please welcome Tim Shaw. Thanks very much and thanks for inviting me to present. Um, so how many people here are cancer care coordinators? That's great, there's a good, good smattering of people. Um, so what I'm, what I'm reporting on today is a, is a project that the Cancer Institute's initiated, and this is the team, obviously I'm just one member of that team. Um, on the left hand side is the University of Sydney, um, people that are involved in that project. On the right hand side are, are many of the Cancer Institute um, members that are involved in this project as well. So I guess what we're really looking at on, on, on behalf and of and with the Cancer Institute is, is, is really starting to, 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 to look at how we can look at measures of success of coordinated care. I think Sandra gave a really nice presentation then on the kind of success of, of, of her role within Broken Hill in coordinating that. I mean, some of the background to the project we're looking at, I, I guess it's fair to say some of it has been stimulated by many of you would know there's been a, a change in the funding model for how um, cancer care coordinators are supported in, in terms of that relationship. And that, that might have been the original um, trigger for some of the work in here. But I think we've reached a, a logical point in the development of, of, of cancer care coordination or coordinated care, where it's time to start to look at how can we actually measure um, the success within that. I mean, I think Sandra's got some nice examples of the kind of success that she's been doing there. Obviously, some of the work that Jane was referring to as well about the primary care interface is obviously important as well. But I think we've reached that point in time to start to kind of look at this. I think particularly with the um, role of the care coordinators, we know there's, there's some inequities around um, which kind of coordinators there are for different tumour streams. Um, there, there's not equal distribution of care care coordinators and so on. So this is what we're, we're, we're looking at as, as a background to this. Um, and then the University of Sydney um, was commissioned to undertake a kind of a consultative approach to look at how we can develop what we're calling success factors as, as a first step um, down this process. Um, to, to give you a, a kind of a brief background of, of the process that we're actually going through, uh, it's a multi-layered um, program we're looking at. So we started off with, uh, there was a cancer care workshop run by Patsy Yates, who many of you know um, last year. Uh, and then uh, my group um, was looking at a, a scoping of a literature review around the evidence around uh, coordinated care. We ran a, a stakeholder um, survey. Many of you have been invited to take part in that. We had over 20 really considered responses to that stakeholder, stakeholder survey, which was great. And then we also had consumer in, input in, into the um, development of these success factors, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. We then went through a process of kind of refining those success factors, and we came up with 20 success factors. We went through a lot of iterations. We looked at some of the, you know, the work that Jane had done over, over the last year or two around um, how we measure um, success in, in this area as well with some of the surveys and so on. So that, that's led us now to um, priority setting, um, a series of priority setting workshops, which a number of you have been to, I know, over the last um, couple of months in the audience. From there, we're actually going to look at how we can develop a set of priority factors. So then the Cancer Institute then can go away and start to develop the first set of key performance indicators, I guess, around, um, around how we're measuring success in, coordination, uh, in coordinated care. Uh, I'm really conscious of Jerry's slide when he was showing that first hump of KPIs. And he can go, Jesus, you know, here am I going to stand up and give a presentation on KPIs and we're only on the first hump. <laughs> two humps to go. Um, so, but, but I mean, I, I really hope that, that the kind of exercise we're going through and that engagement and kind of collaboration can get us up to that kind of third hump fairly quickly. And I think the kind of collaborative work that you're doing, Sandra, is a really nice example of, of climbing that hump up. But, but I, do, I do think we do need to have some measures that we can, we, the reality is we have to have some measures to start to see whether we can measure the success of our, our endeavours. Um, so what is a success factor? I was a little bit dubious about this to start with. You know, can you develop a success factor? I've been really interested in coordination of care for some time. Um, and uh, I was at the 
COS a success meeting many, I'm sorry, the coordinated care meeting in Melbourne must have been kind of seven or eight years ago now. And, and it was kind of like, you know, are we kind of moving forward in our definition of um, coordinated care? So what, what we did was, was look at everything and say, can we come up with a set of kind of broad terms that allow us to describe um, what successful coordinated care actually looks like? And then obviously underneath that you can have a set of, of, of indicators to help us um, kind of measure those. And we went, uh, Sarah in my team, Sarah York, who's done a great job on this, spent days and days kind of looking through these and you'd concertina out to 60 and then you'd come back down to three and it was just a, to actually try and get the right mark around that, that allowed you to, to look at the kind of different stages of what coordinated care was and, and how that fits in. And, and we had a lot of debate as well as about what is quality compare, uh, quality care, sorry, compared to coordinated care and things like that. In the end though, I'm, I'm fairly happy with the, with the set that we've developed and we've been getting pretty positive feedback from the meetings um, we've been running so far. So an example of a success factor here, this is a pretty obvious one, we've talked about this pretty well all morning, I think, um, that patients receive timely and appropriate care on the pathway from first presentation to diagnosis and commencement of treatment. So um, this is obviously a key, a key one, um, and the indicators there then, just as examples of indicators, might be time from first presentation to treatment is recorded and meets recognised tumour specific benchmarks, uh, and, and an indicator could be around patient survey indicates time to um, treatment is, is acceptable. I mean, obviously, when we're looking at this, the, the indicator development is being is going to be a long collaborative process moving forward to to get those indicators right, and, and obviously we're looking at whether there's process indicators that cover across all tumour streams or do we have to immediately dive into having indicators for each of the tumour streams and so on. But that's all kind of ahead of us, I guess. So I, I don't expect you to, to be able to, I, I don't have time to read all, all 20 of them here, but I, I'm sure the Cancer Institute at some point would be, would be happy, or well, these will be being shared. And as I said, we're, we're, we're putting these through a process of, of review at the moment with many of you. Um, so, you know, as I flick through them, you're, you're probably seeing that we cover a range of issues from um, appropriate referrals through to, to information distribution. Um, there's some interesting ones. We've had lots of debates around about should everybody have their own record and so on. Um, we came up with 20 because we thought 20 was a more manageable number than 60 to then put forward into a, into a it's kind of a, a, a number that you can actually kind of deal with, I guess, across the spectrum. So, so then, then what we've now moved forward to is we're now looking at um, or running these priority setting workshops. And um, we've really, because we really do have to make some decisions on which of these um, areas do we start to look at. Because the Cancer Institute doesn't want to go away and develop 64 key performance indicators for coordinated care and then everybody in the system will be drowned in just trying to actually um, measure those KPIs, many of which will be perhaps not very meaningful. So we do want to prioritise this down, which is why we've been running this, um, this workshop uh, process and, and as I said a number of you have been part of this in the last couple of weeks. Um, and it was based on a, on a methodology I'm actually going to give in my next talk and I apologise you get me twice in a row because um, one of my colleagues couldn't be here tomorrow, um, that we developed at Sydney Catalyst to help kind of force this prioritisation. It's based on a, on a, on a democracy um, type method, which we found to be very effective. Um, so what we've been doing in that prioritisation process is we, we've been looking at the, um, we have the success factors, and we look at two major um, uh, indicators around that we want people to grade the success factors on. So that's significance and measurability. Again, you could have had 35 different measures that you could put in there, but when you really look at the literature, you want to have a few number of, of measures to get people to start to, to come to some, some consensus. What we do within the workshop is people fill it out themselves first after some discussion of the success success factors um, and then we go into a small group and, and we start to actually um, force people to actually pick three or four of these success factors and we have discussion around that. So in significance um, we're looking at, we've just come up with a simple thing, what's going to have the most impact on um, patient outcomes and then in measurability, this, is, this has been much harder than the significance, so measurability this has to be something that we can do in the next couple of years and without a whole team of researchers to do endless um, document review and things like that. So it's kind of what can we really realistically measure without grinding the system to a halt, just measuring stuff and not actually doing anything. Um, so obviously there's a number of data sources and so on. And we've had some really interesting discussion at the workshops around these issues. 
So this is just to give you an example of one we ran um, the other day. This is the kind of the results we get. Um, so you start to give people a few stars that they can pick on and, and, and allow them to start prioritizing. I mean, we have about a 40-minute discussion as part of this, and you gain a lot of information, a lot of input from people um, during, during that discussion. So did we reach consensus? This is the, the kind of views from the first couple of workshops. Um, and, and the yellows are the ones where we're starting to get most people kind of agreeing. Um, and, and we're certainly starting to find that we're getting consensus. I think I put a slide in of some of the main priorities. So you know, the patients receiving time and appropriate care on the pathway um, came up very strongly. Um, interestingly, the second point there, which I think is really important with the coordinated care, and perhaps hasn't been a a major focus is saying who of the patients are actually going to be the most at risk of falling through the crack. Not necessarily by tumour stream, although I think I actually think some of the tumour streams that we talked about this morning, like lung, are some of the most difficult ones and are probably perhaps some of the most least supported at the moment. But also there's individuals within those tumour populations that are probably more at risk, and I think the Cancer Institute, I know Sanchez is particularly interested in exploring that kind of risk factor. Um, then this care plan keeps coming up, although I, I think it's a really challenging issue about what is a care plan, and as many people have looked at this for a long time. Then um, transfer of information again between primary and uh, um, community, care, community care providers and specialist services, the time and the appropriate keeps coming up. And then, and then this screening around physical and psychological uh, as, as being a really key success factor. Although, you know, there's obviously some challenges about does that screening actually really lead to improved referrals and so on. So many of these, it's a bit of a, we're still really looking at what the impact of these are. Interestingly, I will say that we've run two meetings with um, care coordinators over the, um, over the last two weeks, one at North Shore and one at POW. And, and one, of the, one of the ones that came up, this, this, this data was from a, a more kind of broad stakeholder group, but when we were talking to the care coordinators, um, one of the key things that came up was, was keeping people, uh, reducing the number of inappropriate admissions to ED, and that, and that came up really strongly from your talk, Sandra, as well. So everybody really discussed that. How the heck we measure it is another challenge. But that certainly came up as one of the key roles and, and one of the key impacts for, for, for patients was to keep them out of ED um, um, and, and, the, and the care coordinator, I think, is a key role in, in that process. Um, so next steps, we, um, we've just run two of the four workshops I'm talking about there. We're running one out at Nepean and uh, I think um, Westmead over the next two weeks. Um, so we'll have talked, I hope, about 60 of the care coordinators during that process. Um, we're running a, a workshop with the Cancer Council and we have representatives from Cancer Voices and other groups coming to a, a, a community a consumer group. And, and then obviously the next step, as I said, is to, to run success factors. So just in conclusion, I think this is the first time from what we can see that somebody's tried to attempt to set a, a, a number of um, success factors and identify them. Um, uh, so far, we've got some really good agreement across what the priorities are, so um, that's good because then I think we can move forward and, and create some KPIs. And I think it's a really constructive um, project to move forward on um, to help see if we can't measure um, you know, the, the success that we've had, again, going back to Jerry's talk, is about not that 5%, but maybe we can actually measure the success we've been having as well as has been punitive in, in, in the development of the KPIs. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Tim. I do have to come back, aren't I? Next you do have to come yeah, back. Sorry. You are next. So don't go too far away. <laughs> so Professor Tim Shaw, again, will be um, our next presenter. And the next work that um, uh, Tim will focus on is the work that he has been doing with the Sydney Catalyst Translational Cancer Research Centre. So Tim's work will be looking at the systematic approach to closing evidence gaps in cancer care and the Sydney Catalyst experience and it'll be with a particular focus on the flagship implementation program around lung cancer care. So please welcome again Tim Shaw. I do apologise for that. So anyway, um, yeah, Deb unfortunately couldn't be here to make it today to make the presentation itself today. So, so look, what I wanted to present today, and I apologise, some of you I think have heard some of the talk we've been doing at Sydney Catalyst around lung cancer, although I'm sure there's many that haven't. Um, oops. So what what would what would 
Sydney Catalyst, for those of you who don't know what it is, is um, one of the seven, well, now seven, translational cancer research centres that the Cancer Institute's um, uh, set up over the last um, uh, two and a half years into that process. I actually think it's a really good program that's actually really going to kind of revolutionise on some levels the way that, that, that some of the research is put out and how people actually collaborate together. I think going up those humps again, I think that's what the translational cancer research centres have the potential to achieve. So I, I'm a member of that group. I, I I chair the um, what's called the T2, T3, um, which is the Evidence into Practice Working Party, um, and, and I work with, with, with colleagues who are very, very experienced implementation scientists like Jane Young and, and others in, in the audience that are here. Um, so there's a number of us on, on, on this um, proposal, as you can see, because I think one of the key things when you're doing implementation science is you need a really broad church of people to join you to have success in, in that space. So here's, here's just the, um, the working group that we work with there. There's about 10 or 15 of us on, on, on that working group. And we're primarily, Sydney Catalyst is a huge thing. It covers off um, Western New South Wales LHD, which is Ruth Jones is out there as the camp. I don't know, is Ruth here today? No, okay. Then we've got St Vincent's Hospital with Emily Stone, Royal Prince Alfred um, with David Barnes and Phil Beale and his team. So it's, it's a broad, and, and um, Shiraz herself was introducing us in the, in the team, obviously, at um, at Royal Prince Alfred as well. So I guess before I started, I just wanted to give a quick slide on my kind of view on, on implementation science, because that's what we're really looking at at the moment, how you get that kind of evidence into practice. And there's lots of different definitions of what people see as implementation science. And I, I personally come from a biomedical research background originally, and then moved into education, and then the last four or five years is more into implementation science. I guess when I, I'm trying to explain it to people, particularly to, to hardcore biomedical clinical trials researchers about where we've been going, is I think if you look over the kind of 1990s to present, is it was, we really had a focus on evidence-based medicine. You know, it's all about gaining that evidence and creating it. That's obviously based on a lot of discovery-type research and clinical trials. Many of you have been involved in development of guidelines and other processes as well. I think what's happened over the last five years or so is that, that there's kind of this, there's a growing recognition that the generation of all that evidence, I, I can't remember if it was the minister or David referred to the fact that if we, or it might have been Sancha, that if we actually just implement what we actually already know, then we'll have a very significant impact on, on, on cancer. And, and I think that's been something that's really people have woken up to. Um, certainly there's been some pivotal papers like Jeffrey Braithwaite's um, care track study around, around um, uh, the lack of evidence based to some of the treatments that are out there we know that it can take a long time to get that evidence into practice. I do a lot in safety and quality uh, and you know that figure of about a 16% adverse events in hospital has been really difficult to change even though we've known that for 20 years. There haven't been really significant changes in some of the metrics ar around safety and quality. So I think that's what's really led to this focus on, on, on translation of evidence into practice. So I've got that kind of dotted green line to the left of this. People have been doing implementation science for years. Jane, um, uh, there's other people obviously internationally, there's, there's, there's Grimshaw, there's Grohl in Holland. It's not a new discipline, it's been there for some time. But I think it's got some kind of more kind of legs now because of the way this is going. And it's not replacing our evidence-based medicine. In fact, what we need to do is we're really looking at how the two interface now effectively, I think. And, and, and I've been delighted to, to work with Carrie a little bit over the last couple of months about how, how we can maybe integrate the QI as well into some of this. So when I look at implementation science like this, it's now it's talking about data. How do we get accurate data to analyse what we're doing? Do we have to do gap analysis to find the areas we really want to work on? I think engaging with the systems and clinicians is absolutely vital. And then and perhaps where many people see implementation science traditionally, or I see it more broader than that, is you know, taking rigorous approach to applying and, and evaluating interventions to change that practice. And then they can synergize off each other. And then to me, that's implementation research, personally, although obviously there's some debate around the actual definitions of that. Anyway, that's my little thing. So now I'll move on to the project. So why lung cancer? Don't need to talk about that. Um, I thought the consumer was fabulous this morning. Uh, every time I give a talk, somebody comes up to me at the end and says they've just lost somebody to lung cancer. They're so glad people are working on it. It's been remarkable, actually. It's been quite humbling at times. Um, so in terms of the flagship project, we're, we're trying to take a systematic approach um, to this again, you know, working on, on, on with the expertise, the great expertise we have within our team. So, uh, and, and I should e acknowledge um, Nicole Rankin, who's unfortunately this is clashing with the lung cancer conference in Brisbane. So there's, there's many people in lung cancer probably not here today that would be if that wasn't clash wasn't on. So Nicole in particular has been 
I'm leading a project where we looked at, you know, can we identify gaps in lung cancer? And, um, and we looked at, at all the kind of studies internationally, patterns of care studies, and then we looked at, um, at local data where it's available. We know that's pretty poor in certain places. And we came up with um, a set of kind of like almost like the seven deadly sins, if you like, the seven gaps in lung cancer care that we, we could identify. Um, and then what we've done now is we've taken that through a prioritization setting process, again, similar to what I described previously with our th three clinical sites, so that's St. Vincent's Orange um, and the Western um, New South Wales and, and RPA Lifehouse. And, and we're now kind of in, in engagement with those teams. And I think that's been really useful to engage with those teams. It's taken us a, quite a long time, perhaps longer than we anticipated, but now we feel we are with those teams that we can actually start to look at the kind of interventions that we can do. And obviously now we're moving forward, hopefully, into actually applying some interventions to close um, those gaps so we get some kind of a cycle. So again, it's just trying to take a bit of a systems approach to this so you don't just go and leap in and just try and, an intervention here, but you try and make it part of a, a broader idea. And it certainly had its challenges, I, I won't deny that. So in terms of the evidence practice gaps, I, I've already mentioned this. Um, Nicole looked at a whole part of it. These are the gaps. I, I, these are about to be published, I think. Um, they've got, um, uh, there's the seven of them, Number one, a timely diagnosis and referral for treatment in your in your lung cancer book. I think is it 39? Only 39% of people that have a um, a, a localised tumour receiving surgery. There's a whole pile of reasons for that. I don't think that means this is 60% that are missing out, but obviously there's a considerable number that are. Um, so that's number two point there, I should say. Uh, obviously the nihilism and stigma of, 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 of lung cancer contributes to this. Uh, people with, with advanced lung cancer who benefit from palliative treatment don't always um, receive it. Um, and people with lung cancer, so if you're older, you've got comorbidities, which is often the case with lung cancer, um, then uh, you perhaps don't receive the same um, level of service if you don't have those um, comorbidities or you're younger. Uh, people that would review, this is a difficult one, people with lung cancer would benefit from a review at multidisciplinary teams meetings and not always being reviewed. I haven't found a lung cancer team yet that has time to review everybody. They're just slammed. So we've got to find a way perhaps of, of, of working out which of the ones can actually, um, who, will, who most benefits from those reviews. Um, obviously, lung cancer is not a pleasant disease. There's high levels of psychosocial distress, and they're certainly not being met. And that number seven, um, last one, refers to the Tamil study um, recently that actually people with um, uh, early referral to palliative care services actually have a survival benefit not just better, and I think there's a whole tangle around this palliative care and what does it mean and getting people to it early. So we have, we're actually looking at a project to that as well. So in terms, I, I, I mean, uh, this is, I didn't realize they were going to be back-to-back -back talks, so I apologize. So it's so obviously a price sitting process. We, we, this is how we tested this, and it went well. So we took those seven gaps to our clinical teams. We gave people slightly different. We gave them gold and silver stars to keep it interesting. And then we allowed people to kind of invest at the end. We, we gave them um, 100 Catalyst dollars to, to invest against it, which of the priorities they most want to work with. So this was to allow the teams to actually self-select. So in, in quality improvement, we all know it's much better if it's got some bottom-up drive. Um, and I think that applies to implementation as well. So if you have some bottom-up enthusiasm, then we'll have the clinical teams being part of that process. And, and I think that's, that's the case in what we've done. So here's, here's again another democracy sheet, much easier with seven than 20, um, but we still, we still manage this. So in terms of the priorities um, we found, um, not surprisingly, I guess, that the timely diagnosis and referral for treatment was, um, was, was number one, and, and number two was, uh, was actually the early referral or, or referral to palliative services was, was the case as well. And it wasn't necessarily, and, and the sites were different. So, in fact, the rural sites that we have actually deal with palliative care quite well. So not everything rural is, 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 is worse by any means. Um, I think that, you know, that local connection, palliative relationship, certainly out of Dubbo, you know, when we've met with the man at Orange, is quite, whereas some of the bigger centres, people get lost perhaps a bit more in that, in, in that palliative one. But obviously it's a real challenge, as you, you were saying earlier, um, Sandra, around, around that, that getting people in quickly is perhaps the big rural challenge. And, and, we, know, and we know that GPs um, just say they just want somebody that will pick up the phone is, is another key characteristic of who they refer to. And I think Jane's data demonstrated that earlier on. So, whoops, sorry, I've already, I must be pushing the button by mistake. So where are we going? Now we're in kind of flagship phase two. Um, obviously, everything with implementation science, where everybody has done it, you keep, even, even though the, the, the intervention's on the horizon, every time you open another box, there's another whole 
pile of things you've got to unpack before you can actually get to the intervention. Um, and I think that's why implementation science is quite a lengthy process at times. So at the moment, we're in the middle of process um, mapping across those three sites. We ran a number of workshops, so great your work. I, Sandra, I'd love to um, you know, work with that again, um, have a look at what you've been doing. So we've been doing interviews with GPs, although, as, as Jane said, God damn, it's hard to get GPs to talk to you. Um, so that's, that's, that's a real challenge we've got at the moment. And then we're looking really at kind of data audits and records just to see how people are flowing through that. Um, and then um, we're looking to have a pilot implementation over the next 12 months to, to, uh, on at least one of our evidence practice gaps. I guess what I'm trying to achieve, I hope, with some of this is, is, a, is a program of work around lung cancer rather than lots of individual projects because there's a real focus around that. There's an energy in lung cancer. I, you know, it's, it is the number one cancer killer. So, um, and we've, we've been lucky recently to receive funding. I know there's some Cancer Australia people in the audience from the Cancer Australia have funded um, four sites around the country as demonstration sites in lung cancer. And RPA, Dubbo and, and Coffs up the corridor or um, um, a four, and then there's one in WA, Tasmania and um, Queensland with Quan Fong, a four demonstration site projects where we're looking at that and um, Gemma and my team has just been appointed as the coordinator of that project. So, so, so I'm, if we can bring these kind of projects together, some of them have a more quality um, focus to them, others of them have a more research focus to them, but if we can start to make it a, a, a cohesive program, that's, that's our um, kind of aim. So we just got a draft process map there for Orange, and I'm sure um, many of you have seen process maps. Again, it's great if there's people like Carrie, um, Scotland led the way in process mapping. We should be using that expertise to bring those people in to help us do that type of activity. Um, I think that's it.